The web of our life is of a mingled yarn, both good and ill together. This line from All's Well That Ends Well to me encapsulates the entire play. Now, All's Well is often called a problem play. And at the beginning of this performance, you'll see that we do, in fact, have a very big problem. Hi, I'm Sarah Thiel, one of the visiting scholars here at Chicago Shakespeare Theater. This preamble is presented by the John W. and Jean M. Rowe Inquiry and Exploration Series, and we're grateful to the Rows for their continued support of this program. In this introduction to Chicago Shakespeare's All's Well That Ends Well, I'll share a bit about the plot, which I think is unfamiliar to many audience members. And I'll also be talking a lot about the production elements in this interpretation directed by Shauna Cooper. Now this is Cooper's first time directing All's Well That Ends Well and her first time directing at Chicago Shakespeare Theater, but she nevertheless has a deep well of experience directing Shakespeare at major regional theaters around the country. And you'll see this experience bubble up in this performance. Now, as you find your seat in the Courtyard Theater today, you might find yourself stumbling upon a private moment. Um, the Countess of Rosilian has entered, and she seems to be escaping people. <laughs> she is escaping into a kind of solitude. She'll sit in one of the two chairs that you'll see on stage, and she'll gently almost absent-mindedly place her hand on the other one as if she's reaching for someone who's suddenly no longer there. For those of us who've experienced grief, you'll recognize this as one of those quiet moments in the busyness of life when the full gravity of loss really hits you. Now throughout the performance, look for the ways that grief permeates the entire play and really shapes the characters in its wake. Watch for how the play's central agents, the Countess, the King of France, Helen, Bertram, are all acting out of a sense of loss or desperation to replace what's been lost or nearly lost. This is a play, as I said, permeated by grief and the way that grief sort of buzzes and vibrates all around. So pay attention to the way that death and loss really shape these characters and how they try to fill those voids even though it's a comedy. Now the Countess has recently lost her husband, the Count Rosilian, and, and mourns his death. Now she simultaneously prepares to lose her son, Bertram, as he prepares to leave and enter the service of the King of France. Now this happens right after his father's funeral procession. Throughout the performance, pay special attention to the ways that movement and dance are really used to tell this story. Now, the funeral procession isn't scripted in Shakespeare's play, but it's an extra textual scene that uh, director Shauna Cooper has added to help give us, the audience, a little bit more context about what's happening right at the beginning of the play. So as the lights in the courtyard dim, you'll see this first instance of this. The entire company will enter in this funeral procession and they'll establish sort of a physical vocabulary of grief that you'll see recur a few times throughout the performance in subtle ways. So for, for director Shauna Cooper, the muscularity of Shakespeare's language is inextricably tied to the muscularity of movement and dance. And you'll really see this in um, the choreography of Stephanie Martinez today, whose background isn't in Shakespeare, but in ballet. And you'll see that influence working its way throughout the performance. Now, although the play opens on the young count and the widowed countess, the play's central character is Helen played by Alejandra Escalante. Now, Helen is the daughter of the late renowned physician Gerard de Narbon. Like Bertram, Helen's father has also recently died. And when she did, she stayed on in the service of the Countess. And we're really made to understand that in their relationship, they've known each other for a very long time, probably the entirety of Helen's life. Now, despite Helen's relatively low birth, she has nevertheless fallen in love with Bertram the newly minted Count. So we see the first inkling of Helen's romantic feelings for Bertram right after the funeral procession. She'll walk to Bertram and she'll pull a red flower from his chest, seemingly directly from his heart, and she hands it to him. Bertram is sort of amused and a little befuddled of, about this whimsy in the face of so much sadness. And he smiles at Helen. <laughs> she has hope. Now this subtle moment of magical delight forecasts a few other important moments in the production I'll urge you to keep an eye out for. 
First, we get some sense that Helen has experience in mysticism or illusionism or maybe just straight up magic. We're not sure yet. Her father was a physician, but we're not yet really sure what that means in this context. Is he a doctor? Something else? They call him a physician, but maybe it's not so straightforward in this interpretation. And I'll say, um, I'll say a little bit more about this in just a few moments. For now, let's just say that Helen has clearly learned something from her physician father and his skills live on in her. This moment early on between Helen and Bertram also forecasts another moment down the road when Helen has another opportunity to hand Bertram a red flower. Only next time, he's going to behave very differently. Finally, pay attention to the way red really becomes a recurring thematic color for Helen, from her shoes to this flower to a very important ring. In all of her most important moments, Helen is surrounded by red. But also look for when other characters are wearing red and what it tells us about their relationship to Helen. Now, although Bertram is on his way to Paris, Helen is determined to remain in his company, so she follows him in, um, under the guise of curing the king of France, who is currently near his own deathbed. Before she can depart for Paris, however, she has to uh, get permission from her mistress, the countess. Now, the countess is wise to Helen's tricks here. She knows that Helen is in love with her son, Bertram, but so before she gives her permission, she coaxes a confession out of her. Now, you probably see where this is going. It's a Shakespeare play, after all. We have a noble woman who knows a low-born woman is in love with her son, a count. She's going to be furious. But this is the first time we see in this play that it's maybe not your typical Shakespeare play. It may be not what you expect. Um, the rules don't really, perhaps, apply. The countess who loves and admires Helen as if she were her own child actually celebrates Helen's love for Bertram and encourages her to pursue her son. So using what knowledge she's gleaned from her physician father, Helen does treat the king's ailment. Now, like I mentioned, in this production, Helen is not merely the daughter of a doctor, not merely the daughter of a physician like we might think. It's clear that there's something more to her family trait. If you've taken a look at the creative team for this production, you might see a familiar and surprising name. Dendi. You may be familiar with the work of Dendi if you were here for Chicago Shakespeare's 2015 performance of The Tempest, uh, directed by Aaron Posner and Teller. Uh, Dendi played the ethereal Ariel. Now, in Shakespeare's script, it's not really specified how Helen cures the King of France. That scene isn't written to be staged, though many directors do add it in, again, for additional context, and that's what Shauna Cooper does here. So for this production, Dendi serves as magic designer, as, um, as the entire creative team sort of reinterprets what's, what Helen's powers to heal actually are. Now, as a reward, Helen asks that the king grant her what husband she will from the many eligible bachelors of France. So naturally, Helen has her sights on Bertram. So after the king's successful procedure, he calls in all the noblemen of, front, um, of his court. Helen addresses each of them one by one, and all of them seem pretty keen to take her as their wife, but she sets her sights on Bertram. The king, satisfied with Helen's selection, delivers on his promise and commands Bertram to take Helen as his wife. Bertram flat refuses. A poor physician's daughter, my wife, he spits out. Again, we see a major difference here between All's Well and many of Shakespeare's other plays. Neither the Countess, Bertram's mother, nor the King of France really see Helen's low birth as a barrier to her worthiness of Bertram. We don't have the traditional, what we would call blocking characters to young love that we see in A Midsummer Night's Dream or Romeo and Juliet. Instead, the King is insulted and aghast at Bertram's impetuous snobbery. He threatens Bertram to remove him from the king's favor if he does not take Helen's hand in marriage. So Bertram submits. Despite yielding to the king's command, Bertram flees France with his friend and compatriot Parolles to fight in the Tuscan Wars. He leaves behind a letter for Helen. When thou canst get the ring upon my finger, which never shall come off, and show me a child begotten of thy body that I am father to, then call me husband. But in such a then, 
I write a never. Pay attention to the rings in this play. For Shakespeare, as well as many other early modern playwrights, jewelry was often a way to prove something down the line. Um, so pay attention to who's wearing what ring and when. The, the ring play becomes very important to the conclusion of this story. The letter's final sentence lands a crushing blow on Helen. Till I have no wife, I have nothing in France. Upon learning that Bertram would rather put himself in danger and fight in a foreign war rather than be her husband, she leaves France. She decides that she would rather flee her home in hopes that Bertram will then return home to safety. As Helen leaves on her pilgrimage, we see her take a major leap, both metaphorically and literally. So pay attention to this moment at the very end of the first act of the play before intermission. Pay attention to what you see Helen do. Meanwhile, Bertram is with his friend Parolles, whom everyone understands to be a complete ne'er-do-well, except for Bertram. You might think of Parolles as a thinner and less charming Falstaff in like a sassy scarf. So they locate their French compatriots fighting in Italy and join them in training for battle. Now this battle training becomes really interesting. So watch for the ways that the muscularity that I mentioned earlier, that muscularity and movement and language become inextricably intertwined in this battle training. Um, these war boys, this band of brothers, they really seem to come together here in these moments. Martinez's choreography really seamlessly ties together their masculinity, sort of their hunger for armed conflict and honor um, with sort of their youth and naivete. So she'll, she'll tie together these, these military exercises with sort of informal and contemporary dance. Um, I like to think of this as the rebels school for naughty noble boys. But this isn't the only time that we see the blending of contemporary um, music and movement with what Shauna Cooper and her collaborators have called this Edwardian Bohemia. Now I know that sounds like an oxymoron, Edwardian Bohemia, but it's a, a blend that really makes a lot of sense for this production. Um, this play that's so full of contradictions, this play that's of a mingled yarn, both good and ill together. When we begin the play in France, you'll see what you might expect to see in a Shakespeare play. Bodices, restricting clothing, dark colors, traditional European drapery. But then we have some characters like Parolles or the clown Lavache, played by CST veteran uh, Elizabeth Lado, who look like they're from a different universe. And that universe is somewhere around 1970s New York. Raquel Barreto's costumes really help us not only see the way that these characters change over time, especially Helen, um, but they also give us a sense of place. They, um, they give, also give us a sense of that changing of place. So look for the ways that characters in France dress, sort of constricted, dark clothing, versus the way that civilians in Italy dress, more loose, flowing, bright garments. What does that say about the society in which they live? Or what does it say about the way they relate to the society in which they live? And I'm thinking particularly about uh, Parolles and Lavache in that. So speaking of this shift to Italy, we watch also for the ways that the lighting changes between France and Italy. Um, France seems sort of cold. Um, the light is constricted. It's only illuminating what you need to see in any given moment. But um, meanwhile, in Italy, lighting designer Adam Honoré gives us a, a totally different experience. Uh, the lights, they, they look, they feel different. Everything's bright, it's warm, it feels hot all of a sudden. Meanwhile, Paul James Prendergast's music and sound design also give us that, that sense of place between these two places, uh, balancing between this Edwardian space and this Bohemian space and when they come together. We never wonder, really, when we're in France and when we're in Italy, because we can hear the difference. In France, we get sort of classic strings, whereas in um, Italy, we get more like contemporary modern rock beats. And the first inkling we get of this is actually in Paroli's first entrance early on in the play. You'll hear him um, singing a more contemporary song when he comes on stage. And it, it feels a little jarring. It feels a little out of place but then so is he. 
So what I think is really interesting about the, the way the lights and the music and the costume design, uh, the way they pair with Andrew Boyce's really surprising scenic design shift at the top of act two, is that I almost felt like I was sitting down to the second half of a production of The Winter's Tale when they actually do arrive in Bohemia. Um, and I think that is, has something to do with the way that All's Well That Ends Well is actually situated in Shakespeare's canon of plays and how it, how it relates to um, The Winter's Tale. And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. So in her pilgrimage, Helen stumbles upon a Florentine uh, named Diana and Diana's widowed mother. Helen learns that Bertram is actually nearby with his regiment and has been pursuing a sexual relationship with the chaste Diana. And it's at, the, at this moment that we first get the sense that Helen actually has another plan. Earlier, she leaves France and just hoping that Bertram will come home and be safe. But in this moment, when she learns Bertram is pursuing another woman, we see her hatch a plan. So she convinces Diana to, to submit to Bertram's advances. And at the appointed time, Helen's gonna take her place. Now, this is actually a really common theatrical convention in early modern England, um, around the time when Shakespeare was writing and then later on, known as the bed trick. So this usually happens when a man is trying to sleep with a woman he's not supposed to be sleeping with, so the other characters in the play arrange a substitution of sorts. So the woman he wants to be with is substituted for the woman he's supposed to be with, whether that's his wife or a woman he's promised to marry. The bed trick is a common convention for the period, as I mentioned, um, in which Shakespeare wrote All's Well That Ends Well. And well, I guess I, I guess you should say, I guess I could say it, uh, it became a common convention after Shakespeare wrote All's Well That Ends Well. We also see the bed trick in another Shakespeare play, uh, Measure for Measure, which Henry Godinez will be directing here at CST next season. Now scholars often discuss Measure for Measure and All's Well That Ends Well together, and that's because they share a lot in common. Uh, a surreptitious bed trick, a resourceful heroine, um, a wayward would-be husband, and the list goes on. Including, uh, they have uh, ambiguous or ambivalent endings, which I'll say a little bit about later. Now, often called problem plays or problem comedies, All's Well That Ends Well and Measure for Measure are written sort of, or are sort of Shakespeare's final attempts at comedy before he launches into the romances of his late, uh, his late career. So that's The Winter's Tale, The Tempest, plays like that. So for years, scholars have assumed All's Well That Ends Well was written before Measure for Measure. So All's Well is dated around 1602, 1603, Measure for Measure around 1604 when we have a confirmed performance of the play at court. Um, the, the dating of these two plays and the order of them is not particularly important for these purposes, but I think we can suffice it to say that they're both written around 1603, 1604, at about the same time. So to give you some sense of how this relates to the rest of Shakespeare's canon, um, his writing career was roughly 25 years long. We date his earliest play, Henry VI, Part I, um, around 1589, and then his later plays, his latest plays, The Tempest, and uh, the two noble kinsmen around 1611, 1614. So Measure for Measure and All's Well That Ends Well sort of fall right in the middle of his career between his great tragedies like Hamlet and then his later career plays like The Winter's Tale or Pericles. And you can really feel that tension between comedy and tragedy and mysticism in Measure for Measure, but especially in All's Well That Ends Well. So because of the ways that these two plays are so similar, they're also often performed in repertory. So you have uh, two productions having the same cast performed on alternate evenings. And this is probably how Shakespeare's company, The Kingsman, would have performed these plays when he was living and writing. And so on one night you could go to see All's Well That Ends Well and you see a boy actor playing Helen and that same boy actor playing Isabella in Measure for Measure the next night one actor playing Bertram in All's Well, and then that same actor playing a character like Angelo in Measure for Measure the next night. And we see this in contemporary uh, repertory performances as well. And in fact, Alejandra Escalante, who plays Helen in this production of All's Well That Ends Well, played Isabella in Robert Fall's 2013 Measure for Measure at the Goodman, which some of you may have seen. And so it makes sense that two different directors different theaters would see something similar in the same actor um, and cast them as Isabella 
and as Helen. Um, and that's probably because Shakespeare wrote these plays about the same time and the same actor would have played this, uh, the, these two parts in repertory. Now, I won't continue to go into all of the ways that measure for measure and all's well are similar, but I do wanna think about this bed trick specifically. So scholar Janet Edelman points out that the bed trick in all's well echoes the Isabella Angelo bed trick in measure for measure because they have the same intent. Um, they, they're meant to consummate a lawful marriage while satisfying the carnal desires of an errant husband. Simultaneously, Isabella, the chaste novice nun in measure for measure, and Diana, the sort of iconic pastoral virgin in All's Well That Ends Well, played in this production by Emma Lodge, they both retain their chastity, which becomes a very important point at the end of the play. In her essay, Shakespeare's Bed Trick, Julia Briggs points out that of all the known bed tricks, Shakespeare's two in All's Well That Ends Well and Measure for Measure are among the earliest. Not the earliest that we can find, but they're among the earliest. And she argues that this suggests Shakespeare's plays inspired later uses of the convention on 17th century stages, appearing at least, uh, the bed trick appears in at least 21 different early modern plays, which is a lot. So while the bed trick itself is not staged in this production, and it's, it's not written to be staged, um, we do see the precursor. So watch out for that. Look for that moment when Helen and um, Diana are making the switch. It's, it's a subtle moment, but it's a really important point. So around the time of Bertram's sexual encounter with Diana, or who he thinks is Diana, he gets word that Helen has died. And I, I wanna point this out because it's, it's a little bit confusing in the play itself, how she's died or how she's convinced everyone she's died because we as an audience know her to be very much alive and we never really see her plot to tell everyone that she's dead. Though um, as the characters in the play mourn Helen's death, you might think back to that moment at the very end of the first half of the play before intermission and remember what you see Helen do. Now, Bertram heads back to France, where, yet again, everyone is in mourning. But I don't want to say too much here about the end of the play. What I will say is remember that it's a problem play. So what does that mean? Now, when Shakespeare was writing these plays, there were basically two categorizations of plays classically, comedies and tragedies. We get that third categorization of Shakespeare's plays as histories when his colleagues Hemings and Condell publish his plays in 1623 and what we know is the first folio. So there we have uh, Shakespeare's comedies, tragedies, and histories. But classically, we have comedies and tragedies. And to put it in completely oversimplified terms, at the end of a comedy, you have a marriage and there's a rightful order restored to the world. Meanwhile, tragedies are those that end with a stage littered with bodies, often including the title character, um, Hamlet, Othello, Romeo and Juliet, King Lear, you name it. While at the end of tragedies, we get some return to order, it's a new world order. Something has shifted dramatically in the way that the order of the world works. Um, that's when you see Fortinbras take Denmark, or you see Lodovico take over Cyprus, the Capulets and the Montagues are kissing and making up at the end. Well, I apologize for this spoiler, but this play, All's Well That Ends Well, it doesn't end in a stage littered with dead bodies. So that makes it a comedy, right? Well, unlike other comedies you may have enjoyed here at Chicago Shakespeare or elsewhere, um, A Midsummer Night's Dream, As You Like It, Twelfth Night, the characters in this play aren't really prepared to dance a jig at the end. Um, Instead, we as an audience are sort of left unsure and uncomfortable about what's going to happen next. We get a sense that things aren't exactly back to working order. We haven't really established the, the world order yet. Um, we get a similar sensation when we leave a, a play called a comedy like Merchant of Venice or Measure for Measure. So after the bed trick, Helen leaves for France to complete the final act of her plot. Um, and she assures Diana, all's well that ends well. Whate'er the course, the end is the renown. It's not for the first time that we sort of question Helen's judgment. Whate'er the course, the end is the renown sounds an awful lot like another Machiavellian mantra. The end justifies the means. So at the end of this play, 
As the loose ends are coming together and we approach the resolution, the king is sort of looking around, confused at everyone who's happy yet not happy, sad yet not sad. All yet seems well, he says. So at the end of this production, we're left wondering, where do we go from here? One of the hardest parts about deciding what kind of play this is, is it's not really clear who's been vindicated and should they be vindicated, and it's hard to tell who's in the wrong or who's in the most wrong. Is it Bertram for leaving his wife and pursuing another woman? Is it Helen for ensnaring Bertram? Is it the king for forcing Bertram to marry Helen? Is it the countess for pushing Helen to pursue Bertram? Although there's so much to laugh about in All's Well, and in this production in particular, the play, as I said, is permeated by grief and the sort of life-changing, though everyday, losses that fill our lives. Death, rejection, disappointment, and the erratic behavior that grief can drive us to. There are no easy answers here at the, on, at the end of All's Well That Ends Well, and for some, that makes it a problem. Regardless of which way you slice it, though, in the end, Helen and Bertram are that mingled yarn, both good and ill together, with all their faults, with all their virtues, blemishes and beauties alike, all wrapped up in one. Thank you. Thank you.